Um, a very common condition in pediatrics, they go to a pediatrician, and he says there's fluid in the ear. And he says you have a chronic middle ear infusion. What does that mean? Uh, it means that there's mucus trapped behind the eardrum in the middle ear. When someone says chronic, it usually means that it's been there for more than three months. And how do we approach that problem in a young child? Well, the chronic uh, fluid causes several problems, most notably a temporary hearing loss. And depending on the age of the child, that could affect over a long period of time the child's speech development or an older child, uh, the ability to perform to their best ability in, uh, in class. Now, one of the treatments we would use is putting a tube in. Okay, what would be the indication based on your years or experience when a kid would require a tube or not require a tube? Uh, so there are several things to look at. Number one is the duration of the fluid. Number two is what is the effect the fluid is having. As I mentioned before, the most important thing is the effect on the hearing. So we get a hearing test on the child to determine how much hearing loss there is. Uh, <clears throat> even though we know that the hearing loss is temporary, we want to make sure that if it's going on for a long period of time, it's not substantial. Secondly, we want to see how, what uh, the child's speech, um, how the child's speech has developed if it's a younger child. If it's a child who's school age, we want to know whether or not this, uh, this temporary hearing loss might be having an effect on their schoolwork. Um, then we want to know whether or not they've ever had any kind of medical treatment. I routinely will try at least once to treat uh, chronic fluid with an antibiotic and a nasal steroid spray. Um, it works in a small percentage, but in the small percentage that it works in, they avoid it too. If that doesn't work, then I proceed to placing a tympanostomy tube, which is a procedure that's uh, done, a very brief procedure, but it's done under general anesthesia, in which we make a little opening in the eardrum, take the fluid out of the middle the ear, which is behind the eardrum, and then insert a little plastic disc that has a hole in it, which we call a tube. It looks like a little tiny spool. We place that into the eardrum, and it stays in the eardrum on the average of about a year. And that provides the child with a year of time for its own use, for the child's own eustachian tube to develop and mature um, and work on its own. Once the eustachian tube is working on its own, you no longer need a tube. If it came out early or prematurely, do you have a case where sometimes you have to reinsert a tube? Yes. The average time that a tube stays in place, depending on the type of tubes that's used, and there are a variety on the market, but the, the standard temporary type tube lasts between 10 and 12 months. The tube, though, has no idea when to come out. It comes out whenever the eardrum pushes it out and, and causes it to, to extrude, and then the eardrum heals up. If the child's eustachian tube is not matured at that time, and then the child starts either having chronic effusion, middle ear fluid, or recurrent infections, the tube has to be reinserted. Overall, this probably happens in about one in three cases that a child will, who has a set of tubes will need more than one set place. If a child has a tube, which is a controlled perforation in a way to speak about, uh, are there certain medications you should never use in the ear? Yes. Once a child has a tube in the ear, uh, you should understand that anything placed into the external ear canal can get into the middle ear. And the middle ear is usually kept sterile, and it's usually not um, exposed to a variety of different agents. So uh, things that are not sterile should not be placed in the ear. Um, peroxide, for instance, is a common thing, or mineral oil, or alcohol. These are all things that people sometimes put in an external ear for a reason, for some other reason. When you have a tube, number one, it'll burn a lot. Number two, it can cause uh, quite a bit of irritation or potentially introduce infection. So the only thing that should be placed into an ear with a tube in it are drops that are sterile and designed for ears with tubes in them. Is there any particular drop that is like better than using any other drop that is a discharge? I think um, it's a little... Yes, so there are two drops on the market that are really, uh, the only two drops that are really indicated for an ear with a tube in it, and those are Floxin and Cipridex. Floxin and Cipridex are similar in the antibiotic that's contained, Cipridex is different in that in addition to an antibiotic, uh, it also has a steroid, dexamethasone. So it's a little bit more helpful in not only calming an infection, but calming inflammation. Uh, the difference is also Cipridex is a little bit more acidic, so it does burn a little bit. Floxin burns a little bit less. There are other drops on the market 
such as Cordosporin, uh, which is the um, trade name, but there are a variety of, um, of generic forms that say polymyxin um, or neomycin, uh, polymyxin neomycin sulfate. Uh, these are a variety of drops that can be put in the air and that we have been using for many years, although neomycin, which is a component of most of those drops, is an ototoxic drop. That means it's, it has, it's a medicine that can potentially uh, cause damage to the inner ear. And as a result, we were never really that comfortable about putting it in the middle ear, but we really didn't have any other choice. Since we have Floxin and Cipridex, in my opinion, those are the only two drops that should be used.